Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Rosemary Michelle, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about foot problems in um, our aging population, especially those with diabetes. So please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. And hopefully I will give you a little bit of information regarding the epidemiology of the diabetic foot, tell you a little bit about screening our at-risk patients, educating them, providing preventative care, as well as treating the complications that they can present with. So why the need for foot care? Why is it important to render foot care to our population, to this population of patients? As uh, um, Ms. Gomez probably uh, alluded to you, there are 17 million diabetics in the United States. Approximately six million of these patients are undiagnosed currently. Um, we know that diabetes is a multi-organ um, disease. It involves all the organs of the body, usually secondary to chronic hyperglycemia. You um, we obtain a result of tissue damage, dysfunction, and failure of these organs. What's significant is that more inpatient days are spent treating pedal wounds than any other diabetic complication. So recognition of diabetic foot problems is significant. According to the CDC in 1999, diabetes is, was the seventh leading cause of death in 1997. In terms of, of pedal problems, um, Harrington's, Harrington's group in diabetes, in diabetes care in 2000 took a 5% sampling of all Medicare beneficiaries in 1995 and 1996 and found the prevalence of about 7% of diabetic foot ulcers in this population. Significant, the, the economic um, significance is that care for these patients was three times higher than those Medicare recipients in general. What's mo most amazing is 70% of these patients had no follow-up, a little follow-up post-discharge. Infected diabetic wounds, as I stated before, are, play a significant, uh, have a significant role in terms of cost and uh, time spent with these patients. More inpatient days has been spent treating such pedal wounds than any other diabetic complications, as I stated before, and it accounts for approximately 25% of all diabetes-related hospital admissions, according to Edelson in 1996. Lavery, um, in his work here, we found that the follow, uh, following the first lower extremity amputation, there's a 68% incidence of second amputation within five years. There's a 50% of three-year mortal mortality rate. 50% of our patients will be dead within three to five years, 25% of them institutionalized. So what can we do to prevent these amputations, okay, these amputations and these complications? We need to identify and screen high-risk patients, develop educational programs and increase awareness among patients and practitioners and healthcare providers, and to train more physicians and allied professional or personnel. Who's on the team? A lot of us. The family practitioner, I, I know you can't read this because I, I don't know what's going on in the PowerPoint, but I'll read it to you. The family practitioner or the internist, the nutritionist, endocrinologist, vascular surgeon, diabetes educator, the prosthetist or the orthotist, and following, finally the podiatrist. The podiatrist should be the person treating the, all problems in the lower extremity in the patient with diabetes. That's what our training is in. I don't know if you have a lot of exposure to podiatrists, but our training is pretty extensive, of course, in foot and ankle solely. We count on you, though, to help, uh, to help um, identify the problems. We educate and provide the care. We recognize and diagnose the problems, and then we plan, implement, and treat the patients, either conservatively, surgically, or both. When I discuss the education and preventive care in a patient with diabetes, you have to identify who's at risk. We often will um, conclude who's at risk based on patient's history, based on, the, based on the presence or absence of neuropathy, the presence or absence or the degree of vascular disease, and also biomechanical pathology. There are three questions to ask when you're screening for ulcer risk or for uh, complications. Is there a loss of protective sensation? And I'll talk to you a little bit more on how we determine this. Is there a deformity that's present causing a high pressure region? Or, 
and or is there a history of previous ulceration or amputation? These are the three big factors that put our patients at risk. There is factors of peripheral neuropathy, which we uh, all know of or have heard of, are usually duration of diabetes. In my experience, patients with more than 10 years of diabetes tend to have some degree of neuropathy. Um, those who are uncontrolled in terms of their diabetic care, for some reason males, which is interesting, um, age, as we get older, of course, we tend to lose feeling in our feet, chronic alcohol use, and tobacco use. We test for uh, loss of sensation via a number of um, techniques. One is proprioceptive, in which the toe, the big toe, the hallux, is dorsiflex and plantar flex, and with the patient, the patient has their eyes closed and will identify if the toe is in the upwards position or the downwards position. And this gives us gross feeling. If they're not able to feel this, they're pretty much neuropathic, okay? Sometimes this can also be done at the ankle. A bigger joint, more t soft tissues around, um, more proximal nerves, and they can, if they don't feel this either, then you can pretty much diagnose that they are neuropathic. Vibratory sensation is measured by tuning fork. You, what you do is you apply the tuning fork to the tip of the hallux, and the patient relates when they long, no longer feel the vibration. And then you compare it to when you no longer feel the vibration. It's amazing some of the results that we get for these patients. This test isn't really reliable because it's qualitative, meaning there's no number that really tells you where the patient is, and um, it can vary from practitioner or examiner. Sharp dull testing, we usually utilize a soft instrument, such as a cotton ball, or a sharp instrument, such as the end of a wooden stick. And um, the patient undergoes a test with their eyes closed and, and it simply says if they feel something sharp or dull. Light touch, now this is probably what you're most familiar with in testing with the SEMS Weinstein monofilament. Um, the patient will identify the location of the touch with the monofilament, and, and this will give you information as to the level of absent or, or, uh, absent or present protective sensation. And there are a number of studies correlating res these results with the presence or absence of neuropathy. What we commonly use in our clinic at the Texas Diabetes Institute is the biothesiometer. It's a kind of interesting, expensive tool that essentially quantitates vibratory threshold. And it's an instrument that's held at the tip of the hallux, as you see here in the photo. And there's a dial that the examiner will increase the number of volts, and you can feel the vibration of the instrument against the patient's toe. The patient will tell us when, we start, when they start to feel it. Um, 10 is probably at about normal, 10 volts. But more than 25 is considered loss of protective sensation. The best thing about this test is it's easily reproducible. Any examiner can do it, a student, a staff member, even a patient, it's that reproducible. So these are a little bit more reliable, however, a little bit more expensive for every clinic's use. Now that I've told you how to, how to diagnose neuropathy, you need to have an idea of where the patient is in terms of their vascular disease in order to assess their risk for problems. Macrovascular, we, we tend to split vascular disease into a few different components, and we look at their macrovascular complications, their microvascular complications, functional micro, which is of course related to the autonomic neuropathy, uh, family history, and social history. So in essence, we ask the patient some key questions to get an idea. If there's enough of these factors that are positive, the patient smokes, has had a stroke, heart attack, neuropathy, nephropathy, et cetera, we know that they're at high risk for vascular disease. And then the physical examination, of course, is important. Inspection of skin, palpation of pulses, etc. Okay? Um, location of wound and, and so forth. May war this may warrant, based on where you, um, where you stratify the patient, this may warrant a consult to a vascular specialist, such as a vascular surgeon. Biomechanical deformities is the next big category that you need to um, ascertain what kind of deformities the patient has. Is there a presence of digital contractures, hammer toes and things like that? Bunions, do they have a high arch or a low arch foot? And do they have any calluses, corns, which we call hyperkeratoses? Biomechanical um, changes in, in patients um, who are older, what we tend to see are patients who um, their, arches are, uh, their arches fall, they, their feet get, get a little bit wider, they increase in length, um, they 
they uh, present with atrophy of some of the supporting tissues, such as the fat pads underneath the metatarsal heads. And of course, they lose suppleness in the skin. The skin gets a little bit more atrophic, thin, and they lose, and they lose hair as well. The two types of feet that you need to look for are the low arch foot, in which you get a rear foot valgus. Um, these, problem, these feet can be problematic because patients tend to have overuse syndrome, where, where some of the muscles are being used more than the other side. Uh, they tend to present with bunions and hammer toes and whatnot. The opposite is the high arch foot. The patient that has calluses in the bottom of their feet, um, their fat pad tends to migrate uh, distally under the toes, or it tends to get thinner because of the, the con continued pressure at that site. They get clawing of the toes, and this can also be a rigid deformity as well. Ascertaining whether or not the patient has digital deformities is important. There are three types of digital deformities, hammer toes, mallet toes, and claw toes, the difference being the location of the contracture. Um, these can usually be treated conservatively with padding or change of shoe gear. Some patients we may decide also to um, surgical, surgically correct them. The presence of bunions is important. Does the patient have an increased um, eminence, medial eminence, or medial aspect of the first metatarsophalangeal joint, or an increased bump? Um, this is important in our patients who are older because they tend not to be symptomatic. Uh, they have severe bunions and without any pain, and it's never been a problem. But in our patients with diabetes who might have neuropathy, it can be the reason for an ulceration, which you can see in the bottom picture on the left, the break in the skin. And so we need to be very careful in these type of patients and screen them appropriately and then treat them before it becomes an emergency. Hyperkeratoses. Patients need to be evaluated for any kind of um, calluses or corns. Um, it can be problematic in neuropathic patients, can result in ulcerations if they continue. And these are the lesions that we debride every visit. These patients can be accommodated if it's, a, if it's a flexible deformity with appropriate shoes and insoles. These are some different types of corns. And it depends on where they're located, that we call them different names. Calluses are usually at the bottom of the foot. Corns are usually at the top. Haloma molly is a soft interdigital corn. Haloma durum is a hard corn that's usually on the top of the toes. And the important thing to remember is hyperkeratoses or calluses or corns occur because of pressure. So if you remove the pressure, you remove the, the callus. Most times. If it's a rigid deformity, it may, not be, it may not be that simple. How do you treat these patients? To breed the callus. I'm going to show you a, 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 pa a picture of a patient that um, amazingly we debrided the callus and you'd, you'd be amazed what you find underneath. Um, wound care, provide wound care if it's necessary, offload it and appropriately shoe them, and finally provide the education that they need to prevent problems. This is exactly the, the, the picture. This is the same pic pa patient. You wouldn't believe it, but it really is the same patient. And if you look really closely on the left, in the left hand, uh, in the picture on the left-hand side, you can see that if you look really deep, you can kind of see some of that macerated tissue there. And the body will form callus over that, over that, um, that uh, defect. So it needs to be debrided fully. And you explain this to the patient because oftentimes they think, look, look what you created. We didn't create it. It's been hiding. <laughs> so this needs to be offloaded. We offload it in a number of ways. There's a lot of different ways. On the left is a padding that we would disperse uh, the, the ulceration by cutting out a, a section. Um, on the bottom is a post-operative shoe, which essentially, this is a, a special type in, ter in that it doesn't put any pressure on the forefoot, or even what we call a removable cast boot, where the patient is able to remove it um, every day or for showers, or we may just put the patient in a cast if we're worried about compliance. It's important to offload ulcerations. You cannot shoe an, an ulcerated foot. The third factor, going back to the three factors that we look for in terms of screening for risk, is history of pathology. Our studies have shown that a patient with a previous history of pathology, whether it be an ulceration or amputation, is 36 times more likely to have another problem. Okay? Those with just neuropathy are about two times more likely. Those with neuropathy and a deformity tend to be about 12 times more likely. And those with a history of pathology is 36 times more likely. So these are the patients you have to take special attention and, and consideration of. In terms of treating these complications, how do we recognize and treat them? 
to breed regularly are ulcers and are calluses. If it's not something you like to do in your office, you need to send them to somebody who does. Every little bit of hyperkeratosis needs to be taken care of. Once you see cellulitis or any type of infection, no matter how local or systemic it might be, it needs to be treated, okay? Not over-treated, but treated. And redistribute the pressures by you putting them in the appropriate shoes or if they need to be offloaded in appropriate um, post-op shoe or padding or whatever it needs to take, whatever it takes to heal that ulcer. Shoes, a word on shoes. I think everybody's a little bit interested about shoes. Do they have to have those big, clunky, Frankenstein-looking shoes? No, they don't. Uh, there's a lot of different shoes now. Um, the uh, orthotic departments now have become more stylish, I guess you could say, especially for our patients who are a little bit older and refuse to wear sneakers. Um, and, but we have to emphasize that comfort comes before cosmesis. Um, some of the shoes that I tend to advocate um, quite a bit, especially to our community, are the SAS shoes, the San Antonio shoes. Those tend to do really well. Um, they're nice and accommodative. A lot of us wear, it, wear them as, as professionals, um, and they feel, they feel good. They're a lot of comfort. Um, and and just, a, just a hint, if they go to the factory, it's probably $20, $30 cheaper than going to one of the regular stores. Um, Athletic shoes work well, but it also always depends on the type of foot. A patient who has a wider foot usually does better, usually, because now all the shoe companies are kind of changing so they can grasp more of the market. Usually do better in a New Balance type shoe, sometimes in a Nike or in a Via. And the more flat foot tends to do better in a Reebok. But don't, don't, put, don't mark my words on those. But you know, the patient really needs to go and get a shoe that fits well and accommodates every deformity that they might have. If they cannot be accommodated in that way, then a depth inlay, a prescription shoe, depth inlay, extra depth, or custom-made shoe is what is necessary. Finally, insoles, such as Plastazote, um, made of Plastazote or PTT, a soft material that is conforming to the foot, however, will resist crushing or resist, uh, resist um, wearing out, um, needs to be prescribed as well. Not all of our patients, but the high-risk patients need to be shooed properly. Other treatments of complications can include surgery. I think it's a myth that patients who are, who are a little older can't um, undergo surgical procedures. That's not true. Um, I think we, you have to be appropriate and don't plan to, I mean, you have to certainly be careful. Surgical technique, not making sure that you're not um, putting more tension on the skin during retraction or whatever the case might be. Sticking with the simpler procedure, instead of doing the bunionectomy that requires a plate and 10 screws, there is no bunionectomy that requires that much, but just an exaggeration versus a K-wire or no hardware at all is probably what you want to consider. Of course, making sure that these patients have the most optimal diabetes um, control. I know this isn't a pretty picture, but this is an actual patient who, um, one of my favorite patients, but essentially is vascularly compromised, neuropathic, and kept his shoe on for about three or four days. He was a truck driver and um, developed this problem. And you can see that his second toe is also getting a little dusky. He ended up losing the whole, his forefoot. He got a forefoot an amputation. So long-term treatment of such patients is shoeing them appropriately, again, getting them into the right insoles or orthotics if so needed. Seeing these patients regularly, the patient that is high risk with a history of amputation or ulceration, I usually see every two to three months. If they have a below knee amputation, because I know that they're 36 more times more likely to have another problem and will probably be gone from this earth within three to five years, I see them every two months for the rest of their life. Um, and education, education, education. Again, who's on the team? Your primary care doctors, your orthotist or pros um, prosthetics doctor or uh, professional, nutrition, the educator, the vascular surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon in some areas, endocrinologist and the podiatrist. But the most important team member is the patient. The patient needs to know that they have to go in to see their diabetic foot specialist regularly. They need to pay heed to the advice that we give them. They need to self-care, check their feet every day, dry between their toes, apply some emollient. Um, no walking barefoot. It's amazing how many still do. Um, wearing the appropriate shoes and no soaking because of course if they soak into a water it's a little bit if they soak in a water it's a little bit warmer than they can tolerate there's a burn automatically and it's worse than anything that they've ever had that they were soaking for controlling the diabetes is important and of course following up with the primary care doctor 
So why do we need a multi multidisciplinary approach? In order to coordinate the need and uh, co coordinate the services for patients. Have us all in one geographic location or as close as we can be. That's the best thing that we have at TDI is that we're able to, I can send them downstairs to the endocrinologist, I can send them across the hallway to the, to the um, brace shop for their shoes, I can send them to PT which is across the way if I need to, um, the diabetes educators across the hallway, I mean it's wonderful. Um, increasing patient compliance, if there's more than one professional keeping out at this patient then they will, they have no choice but to be compliant, hopefully, and to educate them repeatedly. At-risk feet need to be screened, need to be kept in the system, you need to keep on top of these patients, you need to care for these patients, call them, make sure that you understand that what they're going through, make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do, and make sure that they are seeing their primary care doctors. I get a lot of patients who love to see me because I cut their nails and I chat with them a little bit and then you ask them how's your diabetes and they have no idea and who's their PCP and they have no idea. So, you know, you need to, we need to make sure that they, 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 they stay on top of that. In conclusion, I hope I gave you a little bit of information about the diabetic foot, screening, educating patients and ourselves, um, providing care, and treating some complications, common complications we see. Any questions? Feel free to email me if you have any questions at michelle at uthscsa.edu. We also have a website, www.diabeticfoot.org, which will provide some patient information, um, staff information, and if there's anything that you're looking for that you would like more info on, please feel free to call or email me. Yes? What do you recommend for like um, real dry skin, flakiness? And Good question, and that's something that we see a lot of our, in, our, in, our patients, um, in our patient population. Um, probably due to the autonomic neuropathy. I love to use um, an emollient under occlusion. Put something on at night, put some socks on. I wouldn't go as far as telling people to put saran wrap on, but I have. Um, what I typically like is if they have a lot of hyperkeratosis or some calluses in the heels, something with the urea in it, um, urea cream or um, U-R-E-A cream, not to be confused with Eucerin, um, U-R-E-A cream, um, there are some other prescription creams such as Carmol, C-A-R-M-O-L. Um, those others that are over the counter like Utter Butter and, and uh, Bag Balm, those kind of things actually do work, okay? But for maintenance, the patient that just needs to keep that um, soft and keep that from building hyperkeratosis, I would tell them to, and this might sound crazy, but I actually like Vaseline Petroleum Jelly. It's cheap. A lot of our resi a lot of our residents, a lot of our uh, residency, a lot of our um, patients, of course, can't afford Eucerin and Lubriderm and all those other creams. So I, I tell them to use Vaseline Petroleum, making sure they don't put it between their toes so it doesn't cake up between the toes, and apply some socks at night. Not usually during the day because they kind of slip around, but maybe at night itself. And that tends to do very well for dry skin. Occasionally, um, a patient might develop fissures, cracks in the heels. And those can be problematic because they can get infected if they're not um, appropriately treated. Those patients, of course, we tend to debride the hyperkeratosis, seal it with like a sodium, uh, I mean a silver nitrate, and then start applying the emollient from there so it doesn't get infected. Any other questions? I was going to ask you um, what's, if you have any studies going. Do we have any studies mm -hmm. on people? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of studies, um, a lot of pharmaceutical or clinical trials, um, but they're more targeted towards the patients with ulcerations. Um, is there something specific or magnets. maybe? Magnets. What? Magnets, no, we don't. We don't believe in those. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I'm saying because they're they're so abundant, and if you go to the foot care section, you're right. You'll find the magnet oh, therapy yeah. and insoles, and you're right. So I, I don't I know. I think it depends on the foot, depends on the patient, and I've had some patients say that it feels better, but I don't know if there's any real scientific value or study really validating that. Truly scientific studies. Okay. So. We don't. <laughs> we don't have any studies like that. Okay. When you have question. a case like uh, the truck driver where you had the mm -hmm. left foot was the problem, would you not expect to find much greater on the right foot on a sample truck driver? 
that's a very good, very good observation. This patient actually, since he had never been to a podiatrist, another you know patient who didn't know who his PCP was, hadn't seen him or her in the longest time. Um, we and evaluate this foot was the one with the lesion. However, um, the other side. Let me let me just kind of race ahead to the, to 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 the end. What we did was after taking non-invasives and an angiogram, his disease on the other side was worse than the one on the left. Now and now because he you're right because and, but uh, but before the amputation it was bad. So once we did the amputation, automatically we needed to go ahead and make, sh make sure that we accommodate him well on the other side. And he's done well now, but you're right. You expect increased pressures on the other side. And what, what you, uh, Did you do them both at the same time? And In terms of amputation? <laughs> no, we didn't amputate the other side. That terrifies patients to need an amputation after the first time, after the first insult to need that, the, like to, to lose all his toes, because he couldn't see a problem. He didn't see underneath his foot. All these always the top of his foot. And um, so it terrifies him, but he knows he has a high risk to lose this one as well. It's been two years and he's doing okay, but he makes his appointments faithfully every three months. So we've managed to hold, up, hold back on. Any other questions? <coughs> I had a question on those inserts. I see a lot of uh, commercials on TV. Oh, yeah. About, and this is just for anybody, mostly, sure. you know, not diabetics or anything like that, but how do, you, how do you feel about those? Are they really necessary? You know, <coughs> if you do a lot of walking, if you do a lot of, um, let's say you're very, um, you do a lot of exercising and things like that. That's a hard question to answer because most patients will tell you, and, and beside the fact that they're if they're diabetic or not, will tell you what shoes feel comfortable. I mean, I'm sure you know a pair of shoes that you shouldn't wear more than an hour. Um, and what happens with insoles or orthotics, which is the medical name for them, is that they are typically wider and they will only fit in certain shoes, such as sneakers or the San Antonio type shoes, which in essence, if you wear, you would probably be comfortable anyway. So orthotics are, are indicated for certain biomechanical problems. I think the times that I've seen them really work well are maybe children with those really flat feet with arch pain. They need, a, they need an arch support and it's worked well. Um, let's see, trauma after someone has maybe ruptured an, a tendon or um, sprained something and they need a little bit more support on their foot. That's all that an orthotic will provide. They also have, um, a, a, there's a large market for sports orthotics as, as well. You'll hear a lot of basketball players and football players wear orthotics as well, but it doesn't work as well because they're active, they're running, and, and you're not, your foot isn't really on the ground for very long. So yes, orthotics do work, but I think, I, I don't know if that, I think you're talking about Good Feet or whatever that company is. I yeah. think any orthotics will, will work. Any orthotics will work. But if you have a specialized foot, it won't work. If, you know, there are some orthotics that I can buy that will work well for myself. <coughs> you may have a totally different type of foot, work well for you, mm -hmm. and work well for anyone else. But if you have a very unusual foot, or very flexible foot, you probably won't get a lot of relief from those orthotics. So yes, they do work, and I think that they're probably the, the best way to let a patient know, you don't need that surgery, you just need to change your shoes. But um, in terms of types, there's so many different types, and it's just whatever someone's comfortable with more than anything within reason. I mean, if, if it's an orthotic that you're paying $200 for and you could go and get a Dr. Scholl pad for $10. So that's probably where the big difference is. Any questions? How about heel spurs? Heel spurs. Do you deal with that much? Oh, all the time. It's the most common complaint. I think I saw three patients today with heel, with heel pain. Now, heel spurs is a myth. Um, I'll tell you, 15% of the people with heel pain um, will present with, w if we took a radiograph, would present with a spur. It's usually, the ideology of heel pain is usually inflammation of the plantar fascia. You all know what the plantar fascia is. It runs from the, from the base of the calcaneus or the plantar aspect of the calcaneus to the metatarsal heads, and that's being pulled at the heel, and it causes inflammation. Um, and so what we typically do, if the patient's really severe, is inject, um, apply what we call a lodi strapping, or kind of like an, uh, a support but with tape a temporary support if they do well then they'll need orthotics and they tend to do better with that 
So we deal with that all the time. And probably, and stretching is important, wearing the right shoes are important, biomechanical control more than anything. But the heel spur is a myth. Not everyone has a heel spur that presents with heel pain. Would you deal with uh, marches, breaks, or would they go to an orthopod? With what? Marches, breaks. Oh, yes, like stress fractures. Uh -huh. We do. We do, we do um, quite a bit. Um, and, it, and you're right, it really depends on who. I think I, I've had it seen so many stress fractures than I, than I did when I was uh, rotating through the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Oh, boy. And those guys keep on walking. Those cadets won't stop walking. Um, but, you know, the, one of some of the, the, the most important thing to do is immobilize them, it's get them off their foot. Anyway. Well, most of the time, that, that, that pain, right, right. But um, it depends on, it's sports medicine doctors or orthopedic doctors or podiatrists. By the time it comes to podiatrists, it's because no one else has been able to diagnose it. All it takes is an x-ray, and they should, you can usually see that fuzziness. Well, it was a pleasure. Um, if you have any other questions about diabetes, how it affects the foot and, and, and our, in our population, um, please feel free to contact me via email. Thank you.